If you're joining us online, we see you as well. Uh, say something in the comments, and I'll make sure to hop on there after I'm done here and say hi to you. But we are in part three of our year-end vision series that we're calling The Church God Uses. And I love dreaming about being the church that God wants to use, the, the characteristics and the qualities that we have to have in order to be the church that God is going to use. And so we kicked off in week one of our series by just saying God is looking for people who are what? available, right? Like he's not looking for the perfect person. He's not looking for the most talented and the most skilled. He's looking for the person who's available. And so that's what we just need to be. We need to say, God, we're available. And you know what? It's been super encouraging over the last several weeks to hear some of you say, hey, I, I've just made myself available to God. And I hope many of us have made that decision today where we've just said, God, I'm available I'm available. And so that was first week. Last week we said that we got to be willing to give some stuff up in order to be the church that God uses. We got to be sacrificial. We got to be sacrificed. We got to be willing to give up some things. And sometimes that looks like giving up our time and our energy and our resources. And all the time, it looks like giving up our selfish motivations, especially as we pursue passionately the mission that God has, the heart that God has, which is to reach out to the lost, to the hurting, to the, the brokenhearted, to the spiritually disconnected. Like we're going to have to give up some things in order to do and go and do that. And so today, uh, who's ready for part three of our message today? Anybody? All right. I love it. I love it. Part three. Part three. In order to be the church God uses, we got to give what we got. Now, I don't know if that's right English, but it's true. We got to give what we've got. And so how we see and utilize and use our financial resources is an incredibly spiritual thing. We have to see it as a spiritual thing. Uh, like, for example, uh, there's like 500 verses in the Bible about praying. Raise your hand if you think praying is a spiritual thing. Praying, yes, okay, all right, good. That's, that's a pretty common denominator, right? So there are 2,000 verses in the Bible about our financial resources, how we view and manage our money. And so it is a deeply spiritual thing. And when Jesus was around and he was teaching and talking on this planet, as recorded for us in the scriptures, he said a lot about our money. In fact, he told many stories, many parables, and we told three of those last week. And two of those three we talked about last week dealt directly with money. And in total, 16 out of the 38 parables Jesus told were about money. Jesus talked about money a lot. And he said things that you might expect. You, he said things that like, I want you to serve God, right? That, that's something Jesus would say, right? Serve God. And so Jesus then said, well, like you can't serve two masters. If you're going to serve God, well, you, you'll hate one and love the other. Or you'll be devoted to one or despise the other. You can't serve both God and be enslaved to money. Now, I've, if you're like me, I would thought he would have said you can't serve God and like the opposite of God, like the devil. Or like you can't serve God and like do witchcraft. But he doesn't say that. He says you can't serve God and be enslaved to money. And so as, as Dustin kind of shared already, and as we've been talking about in this series, I've asked us all to pray and consider how God is leading us to participate in this end of the year giving uh, opportunity that we have called the multiply offering. And so we've talked a lot about it. We, we, you know, there's a little booklet out there. If you didn't grab that booklet last week, you can grab that booklet and you can read more about it. But it's certainly something that we want you to do. And so you might be wondering, like, uh, man, it just feels like church is like, they just want our money. They just want our money. Why are they talking about money? It's kind of weird. And uh, let me just tell you, we do want your money. <laughs> I mean, honestly, right? Like, we can't do this without you giving your money. So like, that's, that's just true, right? But if that is strange or it's weird to you, then uh, think about it this way, okay? Think about it this way. This year-end series, this end-of-the-year offering, it's designed to help you be enslaved to money less. 
Like it's, it's designed to help you obey and follow what Jesus is teaching here in Matthew 6, 24. Like that's what this is designed to do. And so we, we have to, like if we followed Jesus, if we've signed up to follow Jesus, we have to do what Jesus has taught. And, and that's one of the reasons why we do an end of the year offering like this. Uh, another reason why is that Jesus taught that it's more blessed to give than to receive. Do you know that, right? And so like, I think there is no better place to give your money and experience the promise of God that it's more blessed to give than to receive. I think there's no better place to give your money to than the local church. I think the local church, that is God's plan A for the world, to impact the world, to impact our community with the gospel for the kingdom of God. He does it through the local church. And so giving towards the local church, I think, is the best place that you can give. But if, if you disagree with me, that's fine. I would encourage you to give there. Okay, because this is about experiencing the blessing of it is more blessed to give than to receive. And so if there is somewhere else that you feel like is making a great impact with the gospel and the community for the kingdom of God, then please give there because I want you to experience the blessing that God has for us. Uh, Another great reason why we do something like this every year is because I want you to have God speak into your life in every area of your life. So that means how we view and manage our financial resources is an important area that we need to allow God to speak into, right? And oftentimes, many of us don't let God do that. And so this is a reminder. It's a challenge to us to say, okay, God wants this part of my life too. He wants all of us to do that. And it's hard, okay? It's obviously hard because Jesus told us, right? The main competitor to your ability to follow God is your money. So it's going to hurt. It's going to be hard. And so uh, if all of this is too spiritual for you, um, I just want you to figure out something that the famous singer-songwriter Pitbull figured out recently. You know Pitbull? Anybody know Pitbull? Some songs that Pitbull has? Well, this is what Pitbull said. Pitbull said, man, money doesn't buy happiness. Anybody know a song of Pitbull's that I'm thinking of that you should be thinking of? Starts with an F, ends with ball. There you go, fireball. (laughs) This dude is worth $100 million, so Google says, right? And Pitbull has figured out that, man, money doesn't buy happiness. He's... He's, he's talking with his buddy here in this, this news, news article. And his friend, his friend goes, no, money does buy happiness. And Pitbull's like, what are you talking about? I got all the money in the world. And I know for a fact it doesn't buy happiness. And his friend says this. He says, no, it does buy happiness. You just have to give it away. And Pitbull has figured this out. If you, you can read about it, it's on, on the internet, you know, but this is what we're talking about today. My goal today is to help you have a change of heart, a change of mindset, because most people don't have a money problem. Most people have a mindset problem. And so like when we read the scriptures and we consider what God has to say in those 2,000 plus verses about money, there is so many things that we could do. There's 100 plus things that we could do today. I'm just asking you to have one mindset change, one change of thinking today. And if I can help you change one thing about the way that you think, I will have accomplished what I've come here to do today. And so you're wondering, how can I do that? Especially when it comes to our money. Like, how can I change something that's been a habit in my life for my entire life? Like, it's so hard to do that. I agree. And I think that one of the best things that we can think of, of how to change our habit, change our way that we've been thinking about money for so long, is think of it like an old car. Or think of it like an old computer, you know, you know, you had one of those before. And uh, so you're going to try and fix it. And sometimes you just got to learn something new, right? You're like, oh, I don't know how to do that. I didn't know how to do that before. And now I'm just going to learn something new. And some of you are going to learn something new today that you've never heard before. Because you're not going to hear this anywhere else in the world. You're going to hear it from the Word of God. 
But you're going to hear something new and you're going to say, okay, I'm going to do this. This is awesome. I'm going to follow God. I'm just going to, I'm going to apply it to my life and it's going to be, it's going to be great. Others of you, though, it's like that old car, that old, that old computer. You ever done this before? You like smack it <laughs> or you kick it or you like yell at it, right? You're just like, just come on, work, you know? Some of us, that's what the message is going to feel like today, like a slap upside the head, you know? And sometimes it's going to work and sometimes it's not going to work. And others of us, though, and probably all of us, we need somebody to help us. We need somebody to, to lead us and guide us and keep us accountable and to point us in the right direction because if you're like most people, nobody teaches you this stuff. Your parents don't teach you this stuff. Your friends don't teach you this stuff. Nobody in school teaches you this stuff. Like nobody's told you. Nobody's taught you. And if you had had that in your life, like praise God, that's a miracle. That's amazing. But many of us go through our entire life never even knowing what God has to say, let alone doing it or getting help doing it. And so um, anybody ever asked prayers for their health before? They're like, God, please, you know, prayer request. You know, you're sharing about your health, right? Okay, well, like, you ever shared a prayer request about how you deal with your financial resources? Like, if we want to be healthy, like, this is a part of who we are. It's all of us. It's all of who we are. And so we can share those things. And um, my goal today, again, is just pick one thing, one mindset change, one heart change that we can do today. And so you're saying, Kevin, Kevin, that's too easy. <laughs> that's too easy. One thing, that's all really one thing out of the hundred thing in the Bible. I know, I know. You're like, just tell me the big picture. Like, just tell me the end goal. I want to see where we're going. I want to see where we're going. I don't want to tell you that because <laughs> I don't want to discourage you. I don't want to scare you. I don't want to make you like afraid or like, I just think one small step is an incredible win for your life. But again, if you're fighting me and you're like, I really want to know where we're going. Okay. I did something special for you. You got to have to scan that QR code over there for the sermon notes. At the top of the notes is a big orange button. And in, if you click that big orange button and you type in the password, see, this is serious. You got to really have to know. I'm saying you don't have to know, but if you really have to know, you can click that button and go type in big faith and you can read kind of like the, the end all, like the, 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 the end game for what God has his heart for you, possibly when it comes to our financial resources. But I'm not asking you about that. I'm just saying one thing, one step forward. And so the first shift that we should make in our view of our money is the fact that it's not our money, it's God's money. And so this comes from Deuteronomy chapter 9, verses 17 through 18. And uh, in this passage of scripture, we're going to be looking at a lot of different scriptures today, but in this particular passage of scripture, God is saying that he brought the nation of Israel through all these different things, all these challenges, so that they would know that it was God who provided for them. It was God who did this for them, that they didn't get to the promised land, and now they got the position, and now they got the success, and now they got the resources, and now they got all this stuff, and they think it was their own doing. Right? God led them the way that he led them so that they would really know that it was God behind it all. And the same is true in your life. The same is true with your energy that you got to put in your job and the, the position that you have and the resources that you have. It's because of God, ultimately, that you have all of those things. And so, like, it's God's money. Your, your money that you think is your money, it's really God's money. So if I gave you my credit card and said, so go for it, right? You would spend the money on my credit card differently than though you spend the money on your credit card because it's my credit card. You know it's my credit card. And that's the same way with our money. We have to see it as God's money that he's entrusted to us. And if it's God's money, then we should do what God says with God's money, right? Like if, if it's God's, then we should do what God says with God's money. And so one of the biggest principles that God says to do with God's money that he's entrusted to you is to give him a portion of it. And not just any portion. He actually requests and invites you. And sometimes in the scriptures, he commands it in the law to give the first portion of it. 
Why? Because God deserves our first and our best. God deserves our first and our best. And I think, I think this is true about all of us, is that all of us, all of you want to give. Like you do, I think, right? You want to give, especially if you come to a church and like every week there's giving opportunity. You hear it every single week. And so I think there's something inside of all of us that want to give. But it's just the fact that many of you don't. And so I think one of the reasons why you don't is because you realize that there isn't anything left over at the end. And so, right, you, you're like, I want to, but I can't because I don't have anything left over. But God, listen carefully, never asks you to give what's left over because he knows there ain't going to be nothing left over, right? That's the way human beings are. There's never anything left over. Why would there be anything left over? God knows this. And so he invites us to give first, to give first. And we see this principle all throughout the scriptures. So like, for example, in Exodus 13, this is uh, coming out of the, the Passover into the promised land. And, and God says, dedicate to me every firstborn among the Israelites. The first offspring to be born of both humans and animals belongs to me. The first belongs to God. The first animal of, the, of a flock that was born. Um, and so what did they do with it? Well, it was, it was sacrificed. The first one that was born was sacrificed. Um, or the first Human, the firstborn male, they, God said, don't sacrifice them, but redeem him. So like an animal was uh, killed in the firstborn's place because it belonged to God. And so if you think of the Passover story, maybe you're familiar about that, right? Remember what happened? The firstborn of the Egyptians all passed away because they didn't have an animal die in its place. And so the first thing belongs to God, and it's either got to be sacrificed or redeemed. And so they make it through the Passover, out through the Red Sea, into the Promised Land, and they come to the first city, the first city in the Promised Land, Jericho. And Joshua 6, 19, God says, everything in this city belongs to me. Like, I know you're going to go in there and you're going to take over and you're going to collect people's, you know, belongings and money and all this stuff. And you can put all the gold in your pockets and all that stuff. But everything you get in Jericho, it's the first. It belongs to me. And there was a guy in that Israelite army. His name was Achan. And was said, no, nah, I don't think so, God. And he took that money and he kept it for himself. Let me just say it did not go good for him or his family. Okay. Another place we see the principle of the first is in the firstborn son of the promise. When Abraham and Sarah had their first son of the promise, Isaac, God told them to do something crazy. God said, okay, this is the firstborn son of the promise. From this line is going to be the Messiah. Like the, this is the great, 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 great grandfather of Jesus. And God said to Abraham, Isaac's father, Abraham sacrifice or kill your son to which it's like what no you want me to destroy kill the very person who's going to bring the messiah into the world eventually through his line this makes no sense and so what did god do remember in genesis 22 he provided a animal to be sacrificed in place of the firstborn son of the promise. It's got to be sacrificed or redeemed. Or even go back even further to the beginning in Genesis chapter 4 with Cain and Abel, Adam and Eve's first children. And they brought an offering to God. And they brought very different offerings. Abel brought the first and the best of his flock. Cain brought what was left over of his vegetables. And God accepted the offering of Abel, and he did not accept the offering of Cain. And so in order to give, we see this all throughout scriptures, in order to give what we've got, in order to be the church God uses, we got to give what we got, and we got to give what we got. We got to do that first. And so like, I'm a super practical thinker, right? So that's like, if you get a thousand dollars, 
right? Someone gives you $1,000 for whatever reason. Then it's like, okay, well, like, I got to decide how much of that is going to be given back to God. And so whatever amount you choose is a percentage of that 1000 right? And so you choose that amount and you give it back to God. So if you say, you choose $100, I'm going to give $100 to God, right? It's God's money anyway, and we want to do with God's money what God wants to do. It's the first portion. It goes back to God first. And so you're like, how do I do that? Like, I'd be doing it by now if it was easy. Oh, I've never done it before. So how do you do that? And those of you that do do that, you know, right? This is, this is amazing stuff. This is life transforming, faith building stuff. But many of us have never done this before. How, how do you do it? Well, you have to change your mind. You have to have a mindset change about it all. Like you have to stop having a scarcity mindset and start having an abundance mentality. Like this, what we're talking about today is faith in God, like quite literally, right? Like you don't, some of you don't give because you don't have enough to give, right? You think that this is what I have minus what I give equals less than what I started with, which obviously is true, right? No one's disputing that. But remember, money is a spiritual thing. And what is left out of this equation? God. God's left out of the equation. But when we give first, then God enters the equation. What I give first from what I've been given equals less than what I started with, obviously, plus God. And with God, there's always more than enough. And this is the principle of the tithe that you read all throughout the Old Testament specifically of God telling his people to give the first 10% of what God has blessed them with. In the scriptures, we see all of this. And so you have to have faith. This is the principle that God is going to do more with the 90% than with the 100% you keep for yourself. Like that's called faith. And you will never have 10% of your income left over at the end of the month or at the end of the week. Like you will never have that because that you're a human. <laughs> Humans, that is a, that you can't do that. But you do have that 10% when? When you get it. You absolutely have it, right? And so we give it first. This is the principle of the first. It's the making giving a priority. It's the first fruits, if you read that in the scriptures. That's what we're talking about today. I know it's a lot, so I brought a fun little exercise for us to do a little graphic illustration with this little toy ducky. This is a Russian nesting doll, it's called. <laughs> And uh, so if you know what these things do, um, you know what happens. What's inside of here? More, right? There's more. So I think you're right. Oh, there you go. Right? Now we got two ducks. <laughs> we'll leave that here, right? Two ducks. One's cut in half, but we got two ducks. So here's where faith comes in, right? These are hard questions. How many more ducks are in here? The answer is, come on, shout it out, somebody. How do you know that? As many as you need. <laughs> Those are good answers. As many will fit. Okay, well, how many is that? Come on, somebody. Think hard. It's not rocket science. How many is in here? Oh, human nature is so bad. This is a good lesson, right? If you don't know, you say, I don't know. Because you don't know, right? You have no clue. That's the point. You've got no clue how many more ducks are in here. And if you're a shepherd, how many more lambs are going to be born in your flock after you sacrifice the first one? The answer you have no idea. How about if you're a parent and you have kids, like in Abraham and Isaac's case, and you say, you know, get rid of the first one. How many more are you going to have? 
You have no idea. How much more money are you going to make by the end of this month? I don't know. You have, might have some idea, but things might change. You don't know. See, this is the challenge of giving first. It's faith. You have no idea. And everything inside of us tells us to hold on to this with dear life. Don't let it go. Keep it. Use it. Spend it. It's mine. I earned it. And we live in an uncertain world. And any certainty I can get, I'm keeping for myself. Right? That's, right? That's what we say. This is mine. Let's try this again real quick. Ah! <laughs> wow. Look at that. I did not plan that, and I'm not going to be able to fix it. Man. That is unfortunate. <laughs> That's crazy. I plan I practice this too. All right. Come on. Sorry about that. Some of you are like, what's going on? I can't see it. That's all right. I'll be back in one second. All right. Wow. We did fix it. Okay. Whew. That was bad. All right. So the, <laughs> the, if you do this again, you do it the right way. And now you got one duck and you're left with that same duck. And you say, okay, instead of keeping this duck for myself, I'm going to give it to God. Now you give this away. You don't have it anymore. Now you still got two, but there's more, right? There's more in here that you never knew was in. And so, let's see. I, I told you how many were in here before, right? Let's see who, who was right. I think this one opens. There we go. So how many ducks were in there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine ducks were in that duck. But you would never know, right? If you kept that one, it's all you got. But when you give the first away, it's the only way you can know the abundance of God is by giving the first away. You will never, ever see any of this if you keep that first one for yourself. And so this means, this means that we got to give before we see the blessing, before we see the provision, before we make it to a certain stage in life, before we have enough dollars in the bank account. And I was challenged with this idea recently. Um, some of you know what I'm talking about when it comes to tipping Tipping is like everywhere, right? You like scan at this random thing and they're like, you want to give a tip? And it's like, I don't know. Do I? <laughs> Should I? But supposedly tipping is supposed to be out of appreciation for what people do to serve you, right? So like they bring you a good meal, they cut your hair well, you give them something, right? And you give them a tip out of your appreciation for them. And this means that you tip when? After you get the blessing of a haircut. You tip after the blessing of a good meal. You tip after you can afford to bless the waitress. And everyone knows that if somebody's older than you in the restaurant, that they give more of a better tip than you do, right? Everyone knows that. And then the tip after, you tip after you can afford it. Like, why would you give your money in a tip if you don't afford it first? And so here's the mindset change that God is inviting us. Remember, just pick one. There's so many, but just pick one mindset change that God is inviting us to have today. You tip out of appreciation to the people who serve you, but you tithe out of adoration to the one you serve. Like you give first 
Not because God blessed you, not because he's going to provide for you, not because you have enough money in your account or reached a certain level in your life. No, you give first because you love God and you serve him. That's why it's the principle of giving in scripture that we see over and over and over again, whether it's a tithe, that 10%, or whether it's another portion that you've determined that God has led you to give that's specific to your situation, right? In relationship to what God has blessed you with, that's what we do. We give first. And so before we end our time together today, I want to give you two more very good reasons why you should, I think, give first to God, why I give first to God. But before I do that, whenever I give a message like this, I always like to give you some specific details of how I personally have wrestled with these things. Because this message isn't just for you, it's for me. I've got to do the same thing. I've got to live under the same thing, uh, the, same, the same scriptures. God's speaking into my life about my money because it's his money, right? And I want to do with God's money what God wants me to do with it. I want to try to do everything I just told you about. So I want to give you a little bit of a window into how I've tried to wrestle with that and figure this out. And let me just say that right, it's been a hard year for a lot of reasons, but mainly... <laughs> because of that thing called inflation, right? Like the price of everything is ridiculous. And so I thought it would be so interesting to go back and look at what I spent in some different categories from this year compared to, I just picked four years ago. You know, BC, four years ago, BC. And so in, in my gas Spending. This is per year. Now I'm going to give you some numbers. And again, just to clarify, right? Everybody's financial situation is very different. Some will have less, some will have more. The scriptures tell us that. Jesus told a parable about that. Someone's going to have less, someone's going to have more. Everybody's different. And so don't be weirded out or don't be like, what's going on? Or like, right? It's just, this is just facts. It's just true. And it's not like, you know, we're better than anybody or it's not like any of that weird stuff. It's just true, right? And so um, my family spent $1,747.51 on gas in 2019. Okay. In 2023, we've spent thus far this year $2,826.74. So that's a $1,079.23 increase in the amount of money that we've spent in our gas compared to year, you know, four years ago. How about our electric bill? In 2019, we spent $1,086. This year, we've spent $1,463.95. That's a $377.95 increase. And then groceries. Woo-wee. Right? Anybody excited for this one? In 2019, we spent $4,964.75. In 2023, we've spent $8,000. $819.26. That's a $3,854.51 increase in our grocery bills. That's nuts. And so the price of everything has gone up like crazy. And so when you think then, how, how much did we as a family give in 2019? We gave $3,549. Our giving this year is way double that. And so don't worry about the numbers. I want to think you to focus on why. Why, right? The price of everything has increased. It's increased so high. But the reason our giving has increased is because our income, we were blessed with more to increase. And we've decided as a family that we are going to give based on how much we get not on how much is left over. Like, that's, that's why. And so, um, the struggle that me and our family, me, me specifically, I'm talking for myself right now, that I'm having as we come to this year-end offering and trying to figure out what God's calling us to do and how we're thinking about it, right? Again, this is the window into our world, but... Alicia and I, our family, we've spent over $6,000 in medical expenses this year, which most of them has been for our lovely oldest daughter, 
but that's just true again. Um, also, we have a third child coming any day now. Uh, Alicia hopes it was yesterday. <laughs> it's like, please come, you know. Um, so we also had to get a vehicle big enough to transport this third child and our whole family together. So we just bought a new van and put $5,000 down into that. And I just think, like, God, like, if I didn't have these expenses to pay, if I didn't have to pay for my daughter's open heart surgery three years later, if I didn't have, right, like, all this stuff, like, I, how much more money could we give, God? How much more? I mean, like, this van, I mean, it's, a, it's important, but, like, really, is it that important? Like, we could give that. And so... This is how I think, right? So the end of the year end offering, this end of the year offering, it's an offering. So an offering is above and beyond any regular giving. And so a regular giving starts with a first percentage of your income God has blessed you with, right? So you get something and you give the first, right? You just do that. An offering is above and beyond that. And so for us specifically in our family and maybe for yours as well, the money that's like in that chunk of the leftover <laughs> where you give your offering is tighter than it's ever been before. And so I've been praying and saying, God, like, what do you want me to do? What do you, what do you, how do you want me to participate in all of this? And so uh, I came up with a number and, uh, you know, you have to come up with a number in order to write it on a check. So you have to come up with a number, and uh, I came up with a number, and I said, okay, God, like, here's, here's what I'm thinking. This is a little scary. It's a lot. And so, like, I, you know, and if you're married, you got to share that number with your spouse, okay? Like, you have to. And so I go to my wife, and I say, Alicia, like, here's what I'm thinking. Here's our expenses, and like, man, we just paid this crazy thing last month and whatever, and like, here's what I think we can do. And so I'm a little scared to tell her, you know? And so she looks at me and she was like, well, actually, I was thinking like double that. It's like, oh, okay. So I'm like, you know what? I better pray more about that. I better be, have a little bit more big faith than you than that. And I better listen to my wife <laughs> because I think God speaks to us through our spouses a lot of times. And so we got to, we got to do that. So that's what I'm doing. Okay. That's my wrestling about what God's doing in this season for us. And I'm inviting you to do the same because God is faithful. He will provide. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And God will do incredible things with our in generosity. Like if we all were generous and gave above and beyond what God has blessed us with, man, like, just think how all the amazing, incredible impact things that we could do, the things that God could do through us, if we all participated, if we all did this, it would be amazing. And so I want to give you, before we end today, two final reasons why I think you should trust God first with your financial resources. And so here's why. Number one, God gave first, first. God gave first, first. Like, he didn't wait to see your faith. He didn't wait to see how you'll serve him or if you'll honor him. He just gave first. He died for you. He died for you first while you were his enemy. He went first before you ever believed in him, before you did anything remotely close to worshiping him. He went first. Romans 5.8 tells us this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He went first. And another really great reason we find in Exodus 13 of why we can trust God with our financial resources. I want to read that for you here. Exodus 13, he said, You must present all firstborn sons and firstborn male animals to the Lord, for they belong to him. Right? They belong to him. A firstborn donkey may be bought back from the Lord by presenting a lamb or young goat in its place. So remember, sacrificed or redeemed, sacrificed or redeemed. And if you don't buy it back, you must break its neck, sacrificed or redeemed. However, you must buy back every firstborn son, right? Redeem that. And in the future, your children will ask you, what does this all mean? And then you'll tell them, with the power of his mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, the place of our slavery. 
Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go. So the Lord killed all the firstborn males throughout all the land of Egypt, both people and animals. And that is why I now sacrifice all the firstborn males to the Lord, except the firstborn sons are always brought back. We should give first because you have the opportunity to pass down biblical, God-honoring spiritual principles about how we manage and view our financial resources to the next generation. When your children or your children's children come to you and see how you do this, you have the opportunity to pass it along to them. And I know, right? We talked about this before. Like this bit, nobody's taught you. Nobody's done this for you. Nobody's walked with, through this with you. Nobody's done it. And if you had, that's an incredible blessing. But I believe that you can be the ones that can help your kids or your grandkids or the next generation that's coming up after you know how to handle God's money God's way. And you can pass this on to them. You can invest this into them. And you will see such a, an amazing blessing from that. Because your kids are extremely interested in everything that you do. Right? You, they, you, this is just true. Their kids are so interested. They're watching you. They're watching you. They're seeing how you do things. And they want to know. And so when, like, when your kids get old enough or, or to understand you know, what you're writing on that check or whatever, and they can peek over your shoulder, they're going to say, what? Like, Mommy, Daddy, you... You give that number to the church or to God every month, whatever. Like, Daddy, Mommy, like we could buy so many toys with that. <laughs> we could, we could buy a new car with that. We could go on a great vacation with that. Like we could get all this fancy, shiny stuff with that amount. And your kids are gonna know. They're like, Daddy, Mommy, why? Why do you do that? And you'll have the opportunity, just like we read in Exodus 13, to tell the ones you love, your kids, the ones who are coming after you, the ones that you care so much about, you know what, son? You know what, daughter? Let me tell you why. Because I wasn't always a Christian. Yeah, I became a Christian when I was eight years old. But you know what? When you're eight, you don't really know what, you don't make many big decisions in your life. And my life was just kind of crazy. I didn't know what was going on. And really, I was in a slave to sin. I was in bondage. But God rescued me with a mighty hand and brought me out into this new place of freedom, of, of living, of abundance in this promised land. And you know what, kids? I gladly give to God, not out of duty or out of compulsion, but because I love God and because I want him to know that I serve him above everything else. Amen. And so I'm so excited to be telling my kids that one day when they understand that. And I get to tell them, <laughs> whew, that for all these years of my life, it's not been that long, but for the last 10 plus years that I've actually made some money, I've done my best to live this way. And I can tell you that God has been faithful. He's always faithful. And it's just trusting him. That's all it is, just trusting him. So God, I pray that you would birth faith in us today. I recognize, and we just echo the words of Jesus in this moment, God, that this is a main competitor to our trusting in God. And so I just pray for each one of us today that we do not get beat down or overwhelmed or discouraged or ashamed, but that we would just simply open our heart to you, God, and say, you know what, this, this area of my life that I've been kind of 
struggling with or, or not knowing how to do this with or not, you know, not understanding or not obeying you just simply straight up. That, you know what, God, right now today, I'm just making a decision that this part of my life is available to you, Jesus. And uh, I'm, I'm open. I, I just pray that we would just say that I'm open to learning more about what God has for me about this. And uh, I, just, I just pray that uh, we would do it because <laughs> we want more of you, Jesus. And we want to know how much you care about us, how much you love us, how much you provide for us. And it is scary. It is so scary. But on the other side, when we walk through that door, we find you. And it's so worth it. So Lord, I pray that today again, that you would just help us do one thing, one small step. Not a lot. Not a, not, a, not a crazy thing. I mean, that'd be amazing if you were just calling us to say, all right, today's the day. But it doesn't usually work that way. One small step forward, God, and just opening our life up to you and saying, God, you teach me. God, you lead me. God, you help me. And Lord, we just are excited to see how you will provide. So I pray that you would increase our faith in Jesus' name. Amen.